Hello and welcome to another complete Cambridge IGCSE PE lesson, part one of our exam series where we'll break down and simplify every single past paper question since the introduction of the new syllabus in 2019. Today's lesson focuses specifically on chapter one, the skeletal and muscular system, and there are 15 questions, model answers and mark schemes to review. Before we begin though, if you're new here make sure to subscribe, hit thumbs up and check out our channel page where you can find a complete library of short videos, each dedicated to a single topic and organised by chapter. You can also access the IGPE Complete Resource Store where you can purchase and download literally everything you need to learn, revise or teach the course from scratch. Let's begin. Question number one on topic 1.4. You can find links to the relevant short summary videos containing literally everything you need to know down in the description. Name the two main muscle groups that enable movement at the knee when running. The command word here is name, which means nothing is needed beyond simply stating the two main muscle groups that enable movement at the knee. So those two, those two muscle groups are the quadricep and hamstring groups, which is verified here by the mark scheme. This is my example answer, which I'll be providing for every single question that we go through. And the mark scheme states that you'll get one mark for each named muscle group and quadriceps and hamstrings or the quadriceps group and hamstrings group, because they're not individual muscles. They are, in fact, groups of muscles would gain you the marks. Question number two, and the command word is name again. This one is topic 1.6 relating to muscle fiber types. So if you struggle with that topic, head down to the description click the relevant link, watch the five minute video, then come back and attempt the question. Name the main muscle fiber type used by a sprinter. Now, since sprinting is high intensity, fairly low in duration, and requires lots of power and fast muscle contractions, we are looking at fast twitch muscle fiber type here. There are two main muscle fiber types you need to know, the other one being slow twitch, but as confirmed by our mark scheme down here, fast twitch, or type 2, which is another term for fast twitch fibers in general, would have given you the mark. Question number 3, also on topic 1.6. This one's a little bit more complicated and is worth 3 marks, so we need to interpret the question a little bit more before attempting this one. Describe the main characteristics of the main muscle fiber used by a sprinter and the main muscle fiber used by a long distance runner. So, Clearly, the main muscle fiber type used by a sprinter is fast twitch, and the one used by a long distance runner is slow twitch. So essentially, the question is asking us to describe the different characteristics of fast twitch and slow twitch muscle fibers. We're going to need to make three distinct points here. So we're talking about three separate characteristics, and we need to make sure that we relate the characteristic rather to the sprinter and to the long distance runner. So the main muscle fiber type used by the sprinter, fast twitch, generates high levels of force, while the long distance runner relies on slow twitch fibers that produce low levels of force. So there's a single characteristic there. We're talking about the amount of force being produced, and we're explaining that for both muscle fiber types or for both athletes, the sprinter and the long distance runner. And that's going to get us one mark. Our second point, fast twitch fibers fatigue quickly. They tire out quickly. They're not very good at endurance while slow twitch fibers have high levels of endurance. So one other comparison made, one more mark, we just need to make one more. Fast twitch fibers use an anaerobic energy supply, while slow twitch fibers require oxygen, which is another way of saying they use an aerobic energy supply. So there's another comparison there. We've only really come up with three characteristics, but we've just used the opposites for the two different muscle fiber types. Let's have a look at some of the other examples we could have made from the mark scheme. So as you can see here, one mark awarded for each comparison made. So we do need to talk about it from the perspective of the sprinter and the long distance runner. Um, the examples were how much force the fibers create, which we've already mentioned, their fatigue tolerance, so how quickly they get tired out, the energy supply they use. We've talked about all three of those. So let's have a look at some that we haven't discussed. Muscle contractions. Sprinter uses fast twitch muscle fibers which contract quickly, while long distance runner uses slow twitch fibers which contract more slowly. So there's another comparison relating to the speed of contractions. We could have also said fast twitch fibers are white, slow twitch fibers are red, and that's due to their blood supply because slow twitch fibers are aerobic, they require oxygen and therefore a good blood supply. 
And then the final point is about capillarization, the number of capillaries in the muscle fibers themselves. And of course, because slow twitch fibers require oxygen and a good blood supply, they have lots of capillaries, whereas fast twitch don't. Okay, next question. State two functions of the skeleton. Now state, the command word there, is essentially the same as name. Okay, so a really simple question here worth two marks. You really need to know the four functions of the skeleton. These questions come up quite frequently, as you will find out over the course of this video series. So my example answer for you here, protection and red blood cell produ production for two marks. And the other two were shape or support and assisting with movement by providing muscle attachments. So the skeleton allows muscles to attach to it so that when they contract and shorten, they create movement in the body. OK, so you really need to remember those four. These or this kind of question tends to come up very frequently. OK, next one is on topic 1.5 on antagonistic muscle action. So the way muscles work together. If you're unfamiliar with this, head down to the description, click on the relevant link, watch the five minute video, then come back and attempt the question. OK, the arrow in the diagram shows the direction of a movement at the elbow. Let's have a quick look at that. We can see that the hand's moving upwards, the elbow will be bending, so we're looking at flexion there at the elbow. Name the main agonist muscle and the main antagonist muscle in this movement. So if we're bending at the elbow, the agonist is the one doing the work, and in this instance, that would be the bicep muscle. The bicep shortens here, it pulls on the forearm, raising the hand up towards the shoulder and creating that bend in the elbow. The antagonist is always the opposite muscle, so front and back. Bicep is on the front of the arm, tricep is on the back, so the tricep has to be the antagonist, and its role is to relax to allow that movement to occur. Okay, Mark scheme, just to confirm, very simple, two easy marks. Let's move on to the next one. Topic 1.3 here. Name a different type of movement that occurs at each of the following joints. Again, another really simple question. Name being the command word. So two marks available here. What type of movements, or what types of movement rather, are, are possible at the elbow joint and the shoulder joint? Well, the elbow joint is a hinge joint and is therefore only capable of flexing and extending. Another example is the knee. They can only bend and extend, flex and extend. They only move in one plane of movement, whereas the shoulder joint, being a ball and socket joint, is capable of many different types of movement. We've got abduction, adduction, flexion, extension, and circumduction and rotation are also possible there as well. Okay, explain the difference in stability between the elbow joint and the shoulder joint. This one's worth two marks. And the interesting thing to take into account here is the word explain. That means we need to do something slightly different. So let's have a look at the answer. The shoulder, which is a ball and socket joint, not actually relevant for this question. I didn't need to include that, but I just wanted to uh, add a bit of additional detail. So the shoulder is less stable than the elbow. That is the difference in stability between the two joints, and we're going to get one mark for making that point. But the question, the command word says explain. So I need to say, why is it that the shoulder is less stable than the elbow? That's where my second mark is going to come from. So I've said, as it's a more complex joint and is capable of moving in more planes of movement. OK, so let's break this down with the mark scheme a little bit. One mark for stating that the elbow is more stable than the shoulder, which we've done. And then one mark for any one of these explanations. We could have said more planes of movement at the shoulder than the elbow. That's a reason why it's less stable. Um, that it's, great, it's, it's more complex. It's a more complex joint at the shoulder than at the elbow. Okay? Um, that the arrangement of ligaments are slightly different. The ligaments, the tough pieces of connective tissue that hold the bones together, are tighter for the elbow which again gives it more stability. So lots of different options here. Take some time, pause the video if you need to, and study the mark scheme. Okay, another state question. These are very common for chapter one, clearly. Remember, I'm covering every single question um, in past exams, so I'm not skipping any out. So we can see already how frequently these basic questions come up for chapter one. State two bones in the arm. There are only three bones in the arm, and they are 
the radius, ulna, and humerus bones. Okay, so two of those for two easy marks. Let's move on again. Okay, the diagrams A and B show a footballer kicking a ball. Name the type of movement taking place at the knee joint of the kicking leg between diagram A and diagram B. So here's the kicking leg. It starts off in a bent position there, and then it extends. So that type of movement, moving from a flexed position to an extended position, is called extension. We're straightening out the knee joint. Okay, so type of movement is going to be extension. And then what's the agonist? Remember, the agonist, again, is the muscle that's doing the work. So in this instance, it's the quadriceps on top of the thigh. When the quadriceps shortens, it's going to run over the top of the knee and pulls on the lower leg, bringing that lower leg up um, to an extended position at the knee. So there's the agonist for that one as well. And a uh, very simple mark scheme. Nice, simple question again. Um, another name command word. So lots of very basic, easy to interpret questions coming up for this chapter. OK, the photograph shows an athlete in a jumping event. And this looks like the long jump based on the distances here. Name the main muscle fibre type used by the athlete when jumping. This is already looking familiar. This is why these videos are going to be so useful, because the more questions we look at and the more mark schemes, you start to see patterns. Again, another question on muscle fibre types being used. And it's a really high intensity event, just like sprinting was in that previous question. So it's fast twitch for one mark there. Um, we could have said type two again, as mentioned before. OK, second part of this question then. Suggest two benefits for the athlete's performance of this muscle fibre type. So what is it about the fast twitch muscle fibre type that is beneficial for our long jumper? OK, what have we got? Well, they produce lots of force, which provides the power needed during takeoff. We know that fast twitch fibres produce lots of force, and that's really useful for a long jumper. They need that power when taking off from the board. Second point, they contract really quickly. Fast twitch fibers contract much faster than slow twitch fibers, and that provides the speed that the long jumper needs during their run up. Okay, so you can see here that basically I've just picked two characteristics of the fast twitch fiber and then explained why those characteristics are useful or important for the performance of the long jumper. Let's have a look at the mark scheme. What else could we have put down? Well, take your time to have a look through these points, but essentially, what have we got? Produces speed, which is needed during the run-up. Produces power, which is needed during the run-up or takeoff. Uh, provides energy quickly, as doesn't require much oxygen. So using anaerobic respiration, which again is really important for that all-out effort during the run-up. Um, and they can track quickly for fast leg speed during the run-up. So again, quite simple answers, fairly straightforward. You can see that they like asking questions already on muscle fiber types. You need to know the characteristics of the two different muscle fiber types. Okay, state two different joints found in the human skeleton. Another really easy mark, absolute basic question. If you take enough time, you watch the uh, videos that I've linked down in the description, all of the key information is in there. And if you learn all of that, you can answer these questions very easily and pick up lots of easy marks. So different joints, we've got immovable joints and synovial joints, for example, the hinge joint. They're the two that I've gone for, but let's have a look at the mark scheme. So basically, there are three different types of joints. We've got fixed or immovable, uh, which was my first answer there. We've got slightly movable or cartilaginous, like the joints between the vertebrae and the spine. And then we have freely movable or synovial joints, such as the ball and socket joints and hinge joints. These are both synovial. So our synovial joints are most joints within the body, including the ankle, wrist, elbow, shoulder, hip, knee, etc. OK, the only mistake I can really foresee here is you might have gone for a specific joint like the elbow or the shoulder. Now, you won't get a mark for that because they are specific joints as opposed to joint types, which is what the question is asking for. OK, moving on. Flexion occurs as the knee is bent. Describe, naming the agonist and antagonist, how this movement occurs. So three marks available here. And clearly from the uh, the, the prompts, I suppose you could say, um, when, when you have your answer sheet, you will get these words written down there. So it tells you exactly what you need to write. So first of all, the agonist, when the knee is bent, when flexion occurs at the knee. 
when we bend the knee, which muscle is doing the work? Well, it's the hamstring. Pardon me, I've gone backwards there. There we go. It's the hamstring muscle on the back of the leg. That's going to get shorter, and therefore it's going to pull on the lower leg and bring that leg uh, backwards, creating a bend at the knee. The, ang the antagonist, therefore, is the opposite muscle. So hamstrings are on the back of the thigh and the quadriceps are on the front. So that must be the antagonist muscle. And then let's describe the movement. How does flexion occur at the knee um, in relation to these two muscles? Well, the hamstrings contract and pull on the lower leg while the quadriceps relax to allow that movement to occur. That's a very basic explanation as to how antagonistic muscle action occurs. And as you can see from the mark scheme, one mark for each muscle and then one for the description. Okay. All right, back to topic 1.1 on the skeleton and its functions. We need to describe the role of tendons. Well, tendons connect muscle to bone and therefore pull on the bones as the muscles contract. Okay, I realized after writing this that I would have actually got two marks for this one had two marks been available because tendons connect muscle to bone would have been enough to gain the mark. They join or connect muscles to bone. You could have also said the second part of my answer, though, that tendons pull on the bones as the muscles contract. OK, so when the muscle contracts and gets shorter, it pulls on the tendon, which is connected to the bone and therefore creates movement. OK, so one of those three points would have got you the mark. OK, final question then. Describe how two functions of the skeleton provide a benefit for a performer in a named physical activity. We're back onto the functions of the skeleton. Another question on the functions of the skeleton. Remember, there are four that you need to know. When it says um, that, or when, when it, whenever a question asks for a named physical activity, essentially what that means is you need to provide a sport to which all of your other answers must relate. So my sport in this example is basketball. The physical activity I've chosen is basketball, which means all my answers must relate to basketball. So function one, I've gone for movement. What's the benefit of movement to the basketball player? Well, shooting requires movement at the shoulder and elbow joints. So all I've done there is come up with a specific example of a skill from basketball and explained how movement um, enables that, that, uh, that skill. Okay. And then the second function, I've gone for red blood cell production. Um, and the benefit of that to a basketball player, well, because red blood cells supply oxygen to the muscles, that enables players to uh, continue working for the whole duration of the game because they're getting that oxygen supply. It means they can continue producing energy via aerobic respiration, um, and that's going to enable them to, to see out the duration of the game. And uh, we have a look at our mark scheme here. There's an interesting example for protection, um, and the, the named physical activity in this example was a footballer is able to head the ball without damage because their cranium is there protecting their brain okay so take a moment to have a look through that mark scheme as well but that's it for today's session all of the questions there today um, were from the may june series in 2019 where there were three exam papers so that was every single question for chapter one on the skeletal and muscular system um, from those three papers as always, I hope you found this lesson useful and I will see you in the next one.